All right, all right. Now, finally, welcome <laughs> to our workshop here for the weekend, Artificial Intelligence and Finance. Uh, pretty glad to be back in Austin. Um, yeah, before we get started with uh, what I have prepared, I've prepared a couple of things, I guess. Uh, hopefully enough for the two days. Uh, just a little bit of background. We are so few people. If we just rush through that I get a feeling for uh, where you're coming from, what you're doing. Not where you're coming from geographically, but <laughs> what you're studying, what you're doing, PhD or teaching or whatever. This would be nice just for me to get a feel. Maybe we start on the left hand side. Uh, I'm Brady. Okay, QFE. Over there. Hello all, I'm Karna. I'm pursuing a uh, Master's in Data Analytics and Information Systems. I'm very excited to be attending this workshop. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Divya. I'm pursuing the uh, MSQFE program. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited. This is going to be my second time I'll be attending because I've attended last year as well. <laughs> Great. Even better. <laughs> I'm Michael. I'm also in the uh, quantitative finance and economics program. This will be my second time as well. I remember, yeah. Evelina, I'm a faculty here in the finance department. I'm trying to do things on data finance. Excellent. Maybe in front? Uh, my name is Cesar. I'm a founder writer in finance and economics. Great. And Don Isam, an accounting faculty at this same time. They were really nice to you. <laughs> Excellent. My name is Thomas. Uh, I'm an undergrad finishing up your uh, finance degree. I'm really excited to get into this Python. Excellent. Um, I'm Nate, uh, undergrad in civil engineer, um, and I'm pursuing um, MSQFE in such a study yesterday. Um, Python is totally new to me, so I'm excited to be here to learn new stuff. Okay. Nice. Uh -huh. Can you place a ticket from the quarter 125? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's the sorry. Are you from my dad? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we continue now that we have lost quite a bit of time. All right, great. New to Python, yeah. Yeah, my name is Sarah Kutina. I did my undergrad in Bangladesh, and now here I'm pursuing a master's in data analytics and economics. And yeah, Python is really a new tool for me, and I'm really excited to learn new things. Okay. Great, great, great. Last okay. but not uh, least. Sure. I'm currently pursuing my master's in data analysis and information systems. And I am excited to learn more about finance as it's completely new for me. So I'm excited for it. All right, so just again to have a clear Python experience. Who has Python experience? Are you sure of that? A little bit, a little bit, a few, okay. Who has experience with machine learning algorithms, deep learning, reinforcement learning? One, two, three. Okay, okay. Good. Who has used GPT? Jet GPT, of course. I've been using the transformers. You what? I've used the transformers, but not GPT. So. You're not using Jet GPT on a daily basis, no. <laughs> All right. Basically, selling your data so you can. Okay, okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, now this gives me a good overview. Um, yeah, let me get started uh, with maybe a, um, a very brief introduction where we are coming from. And I've changed this uh, for the first time to yeah, focus or to reflect what we are doing on a daily basis. So I've been doing quite a ton of things, not only Python for Finance in the past. And even within the field of Python for Finance, I have done or we as a company have done quite a few things such as consulting and development and whatever, but these days it's just one thing. So we run our CPF program, certificate um, in Python for finance, and this has grown quite nicely, and we have comprehensive resources, I show you that. Um, yeah, I like to think of it something like a one-year master's program, so we have enough stuff for people to uh, yeah, be busy for at least one year. Of course, you don't need to do everything. Some people want to do it in four months, let's say. Um, this is uh, what is reflected uh, here. So we have options from four months to 12 months a year. Uh, we have even people who are coming back over and over and say, well, wonderful new stuff. Uh, studied just this class and that class. So currently we have on our platform, on the quant platform as we call it, uh, 330 hours of instruction and with um, GPT around we were able to easily transcribe 
all the videos, uh, I was able to count the words that I was uh, uh, using for all these hours of instruction. So it's well then more than two million words, right? It's quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I seem to be a fast talker. Uh, yesterday I gave also an online session where I was uh, rushing through all that stuff. Uh, when I'm excited about something, then uh, I go really quick. I've written six books. I'm currently in the course of writing a seventh one about reinforcement learning for finance. A bit of that I will show uh, tomorrow in the second part with like 500 notebooks that we over there have uh, 50,000 lines of code, Python code, 350 Python files, and quite a few more resources like slide decks, GIFs, uh, uh, scripts, uh, bash scripts, whatever. So that's quite a bit. Uh, to go through all of that and in part this is of course uh, pretty involved in terms of also the mathematical side like quant finance stuff, uh, stochastic differential equations and, and uh, the like. Right, that's, uh, yeah, that's what we're focusing on these days exclusively. So I used to talk about events and here and there, but this is really what we do. We have currently, uh, or just recently, closed two partnerships with uh, people in India as well as in China that are now representing us. And yeah, we are growing and it's nice, hundreds of delegates, uh, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And all this global, I can sit wherever I want because people are anyways around the globe. So like yesterday from the hotel room in Austin or people wouldn't even notice when I, when I wouldn't mention it, uh, where all this is happening. Here, see what we cover in our program, just for those who are interested and we can like pick and choose where <laughs> the stuff that we are going to do. Um, relates to so a lot of foundations so we started kind of like on a high level and people were saying well we need more introductory stuff so uh, it's not that we started with the simple stuff and then then got more advanced and involved it's the other way around actually but this is just for your reference i'm not going through all of this just also for you as a reference uh, here generated with jet gpt why python and finance this was basically in the first couple of years, this was my sales pitch. Why should we use Python in finance? And these days there's no sales pitch anymore. Uh, you need to argue from a strategic and, and a technological point of view why you're not using it as a bank, as a hedge fund, as a team, as whatever, right? Hedge funds were among the first to use it on a large scale later on. Several people then brought it to the big investment banks and now basically the whole industry is using it. Uh, these are two of our focal points, algorithmic trading. Many people, in particular individuals, come to us to learn Python to then do their algorithmic trading. So they might be a little bit tired sitting in front of their screens all day long and trying to figure out which pattern is now showing up on the screen. Uh, with a machine, it's usually uh, a bit uh, easier after you have done the implementation, right? <laughs> but until you get to that point, until everything is automated, it might be involved as well. So Python 4. Computation finance, that's basically where I'm coming from. These were the first applications that I did personally, like Longstorff Schwartz, American Option Pricing. This is among the first algorithms that I myself ever did. The paper came out in 2001 and I was starting implementing it, I don't know, maybe 03 or, or 02 or 03, so almost 20 years back. And I did my PhD in math finance um, as well. So here are my books, six of them, uh, including translations. I don't know how many. I lost overview with regard to the translations. So here is one translation, which is a Polish one um, in Europe. That's the introductory book. That's the one that appeared last, as I was saying, from the <laughs> high level stuff to the introductory topics, right? Uh, that's the bestseller. I like to say it's not Harry Potter, but still. Uh, Python for Finance up until today and with the second edition I was able to write the code in a way that still let's say persists and makes sense these days with all the updates that came so it uh, was published December 2018 uh, almost five years later with the updates on GitHub the book is still somehow current. This is my background derivatives analytics not with Python back in the days when I did my PhD but uh, that's closest to what I did before I yeah, broadened the activities in Python for Finance. Listed volatility variance derivatives. So I was always close to the equities part, not that much rates or bonds or whatever. Uh, equities and, and FX basically are my products. These are the books uh, from which I also will uh, provide a couple of examples, uh, not directly out of the books, but which are related to what is covered in the books, Python for algo trading, as I was saying, many retail 
investors, traders come to us to learn uh, the trade, uh, the algorithmic trading part of Python and AI in finance that's pretty close, for example, with regard to the reinforcement learning part, etc. This is closest to the AI in finance book. All these books have been translated in different languages like simplified Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Italian, French, whatever. Uh, many, many uh, versions available, but it's a total of six English books that were the starting point. That's for you as a reference. I'm not going through what I've been doing in the past. You can read this or you can ask ChatGPT. So I checked it uh, uh, over the course of the week. Uh, almost everything it says it's correct. Uh, one time I asked it about my background. It says I have some degree from Sydney Institute of Technology, I don't know. I've never been to Sydney in my life, but uh, it's still hallucinating, even if you say just uh, put in facts, right? And uh, facts that you're really um, sure about. Anyway, uh, we come to that afterwards. The agenda um, that I have prepared, I'm pretty open with regard to what we do, if you want to spend more time on certain topics, if we want to maybe skip certain topics, or if you have stuff uh, that we can work on together, that's all fine. So the, the major uh, category we are in here is workshop. So we should work a little bit, work through that stuff. I want to get started with AI in the current state. Uh, not spending that much time, I haven't prepared that many slides, etc. But what I want to do with you, and uh, I'm pretty happy that not everybody's using already JetGPT on a daily basis for your studies, for whatever, that we together uh, go through a couple of things that I consider relevant uh, for the field of finance or when we think in terms of quantitative uh, finance and economics, right? Uh, where these tools are already pretty powerful and pretty helpful, right? I want to discuss then uh, because this is something of interest and I think for you it's pretty, pretty important uh, what the benefits of LLMs and the problems are in the context of higher education in particular, of course, with regard to finance. Then a little overview of the algorithms that we have just to get the formal frame because some of you, as I learned before, are maybe confronted with several topics here for the first time. So uh, setting the stage to then go to really concrete examples uh, like unsupervised learning in the form of stocks clustering, usually of interest, let's say, to asset managers and traders, right, to say what are uh, like the classical differentiation, but I'm not doing it that way, would be something like value stocks and crows, right? Uh, then stock return prediction, I want to do base because this is a simple, manageable case. I would say I would do a little exercise with you, which is related to efficient markets. Then I have advanced financial examples, uh, one about uh, deep neural networks that they can learn options pricing, and then also a bit more involved one at least given the data set, which is kind of large credit score prediction. And uh, <laughs> I repeat the options pricing example, given what I've uh, been doing last year, <laughs> apart from facing simulations on the technical side. Um, this was one uh, thing, and I was preaching one topping in the context of deep neural networks that they benefit tremendously uh, from normalization of the data, but I myself didn't do it for that example. Therefore, I brought it with me again now with uh, uh, some corrections and, and much, much better results than uh, I was able to with this little important piece that I was mentioning over and over again missing in that example. So that is uh, supervised uh, learning in an estimation sense. So we are getting floating point numbers. Credit score prediction is also supervised learning, but the classification problem, meaning that we get um, integer values as the output. Then I want to dive into financial data APIs because more or less everything that has been shown before is, uh, yeah, can almost say useless if you don't have the right data, right? And uh, maybe I will jump a little bit back and forth because for the, for the examples, I will use already data which I only generate uh, yeah, in the part of the financial data APIs, uh, but I've put the, uh, the generation of the data that we are going to use at the beginning of um, the financial data APIs bullet point here, right? Uh, for tomorrow, I want to dive into, yeah, let's say the most recent developments that are now so popular into the generation of data, into the generation in a sense of generative adversarial nets, networks, 
right? I, for the financial use case, I want to present three different uh, approaches to generate data because if we like it or not in finance, we are usually um, faced A, with large data these days, but B, depending on the use case, the data is nevertheless pretty limited, right? When you have a look at the Apple stock price over the last 40 years, that's simply what is there, right? You don't have over the last 4,000 years, and you don't have similar data for, uh, let's say, 100 uh, other time series. So we are per se limited here. When you think in terms of the major breakthroughs that have been in the press or in, in YouTube documentaries, uh, thinking here of uh, reinforcement learning and the story of AlphaGo, um, when you train an agent to learn chess or to, to play um, Go, for example, you have unlimited amounts of data. You simply do replay and replay and do it again and again and again. In finance, we don't have that, right? We have the history and it's there. So there's nothing more. It's like historians, right? They, they can do counterfactuals. They could say, well, what would have happened if? And something like this, we're going to do there as well. So I start with a very simple approach with regard to generating a financial data. That's that we have the historical data and add some noise so that the algorithm doesn't face the same data over and over again, but uh, similar data, let's say. Then simulated data that we take the approach of quantitative computation finance, that we have a model. I'm not working with a calibrated model. And uh, for example, in my book, Derivatives Analytics with Python, that's one of the major parts to, to illustrate how to calibrate a model to market data, to liquidly traded. Um, options and then to use this for simulation, pricing, hedging, etc. Right? I'm not going that far, but I uh, introduced the Vazicek model, which is originally uh, um, an interest rate model, but it allows me to simulate uh, trending time series as well as mean reverting stuff, so it gives me quite a bit of flexibility with a very parsimonious model. Right? Just a few parameters, but they are enough to generate um, yeah, things that might be of interest. And last but not least here, generated data itself. Uh, the GANs uh, and I show how this works with the generator and the discriminator and how they play together and yeah, how you can generate based on a deep neural network. That's the hope at least, that's the goal. Um, in my case here as I use it, returns data which is from the point of view of the discriminator, indistinguishable from the original data. Right? That's the basic idea here. Then, based on that, an uh, advanced financial example, reinforcement learning for delta hatching. So we dive here into the uh, option pricing, option theory world. So for somebody who has never done any finance, what I've heard before, uh, we are now here deep in the uh, finance jungle. right? Um, but and the focus uh, throughout uh, is on the implementation and on the um, yeah on the Python side of things. Then for the you know, roughly the second part of uh, tomorrow, basics of natural language processing. Up until that point, everything is based on numbers, if you like, structured data, numbers, and from that point on here, basics of NLP, uh, this is about processing text with Python, what we can do, very basic stuff, but uh, easily and pretty quickly you can enter here also, uh, yeah, the wonderful world of powerful text analysis, manipulation, processing, generally speaking. Then maybe a little exercise depends on what we want to do or not, how far we come, and then the basics of LLMs. Transformers, self-attention, positional encoding, tokens, embeddings. Not really the sequence I'm going to present it. This is still from the original outline that I came up with after a longer walk with my dogs in the forest. And when I got back, I typed it down and I asked Janet, is that okay? And yet then she said yes and shared it. So <laughs> therefore it's still more or less the original uh, version. Um, Last but not least, what, we, what I want to get started with, with the quantitative finance with JetGPT part, I want to then conclude by showing a few examples, again, based on GPT, which model ever, GPT 3.5 Turbo or uh, GPT 4, and how we can use API, how we can do the same stuff that we will in the beginning do in the browser, uh, basically from a Python program, um, where you then can build your own applications or whatever, because uh, 
when you follow on Twitter the right people, they say, well, again, we have 150 new AI-powered, GPT-powered apps that came on the market this week alone, right? This, no. And this is how they do it, right? They, they have API access, and then um, they build some good product, or hopefully, or they hope a good product around it. If time allows, we can then do a little bit of review and discussion. Are there any questions with regard to what we are going to do? Given the briefing I have gotten, um, I'm not focusing on any basics. So <laughs> uh, I was briefed uh, in a sense of, yeah, we had the basics last year, now let's move on. Um, also to argue this uh, somehow here within the, the, the context of the college, right, of the programs. Um, but of course, if there are questions, if you have uh, m even the most simple introductory questions, whatever, uh, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, maybe I can do also some live illustration with regard to a couple of things that might help understanding what is going on then on the uh, more involved side, right? So if you go and give us the, the GitHub link, then we can... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is... Uh, <coughs> did I? Let me think. Did I? Sh yeah. The GitHub is pretty simple. It's GitHub. <laughs> GitHub.com, right? Then slash Y Hilpish. Y Hilpish, right? And then AI Fin. But in the beginning, we don't need really the GitHub per se, right? So that's the repository. All the code is there. All the code is there. As it stands, when I do some changes or whatnot, I will push them later, right? Commit and push them, right? Here's also here, here's the short version of the of the agenda. Right? I forgot the review and discussion. So that's here, and once you are there, you see the other links, the slides. Uh, the recordings are not yet there, so but uh, if everything goes well, I will. Uh, then um, put the recordings on YouTube, but the recording of yesterday's session took like, given the slow Wi-Fi that I have access to, 10 hours, so I'm not sure whether I'm able from here to upload, uh, so as long as I'm staying here, I mean, in Austin, to upload all the videos, um, uh, probably this must wait until I get back home. Right? GitHub repository, that's also the slide deck. This is what I want to mention. Once you are on uh, the repo side, you have also the link to the slide deck I'm using to basically everything that is relevant, right? Now let me know if you are not finding it or some other links are not clear. Right, a little disclaimer. Um, <coughs> it is, I mentioned JetGPT and LLMs now a couple of times, but I want to highlight here the second paragraph, parts of the content itself I have created with the help of these tools, right? I'm working with these tools on a daily and continuous basis. That's the point, right? Content from these tools and models might have been used verbatim, so sometimes I've simply copied the output, uh, or I adjust code, for example, but what I'm not doing is detailed attribution. Right? I've had a discussion with my publisher, O'Reilly, for example, how this works, how we should do this. They couldn't answer this, this properly, right? Also, nobody can answer. That's my personal note here, how this works the other way around. I have so much content, etc., in the public domain on GitHub in the form of books, uh, whatever. And it is absolutely clear that GPT-4 has been trained basically on everything that I've published over my lifetime in this field, right? So even for my own package, uh, for example, DX Analytics or anything else in this uh, context that is on GitHub, let's say. Connection OpenAI Microsoft is uh, yeah, very visible and public. Uh, and GitHub now being part of Microsoft, the Microsoft family, uh, I don't know how this works, right? So it knows basically everything about my package, but the license uh, doesn't allow any commercial usage of the code nor the content, right? 
That's the one that I want to highlight because I have many stuff like this, what I'm doing now here, uh, where I have MIT license. That's a little bit different, right? But the DX Analytics license is different, right? Although it's in the public domain and it's open source, doesn't mean that you can do anything with it. What do you want? And with this package, it's explicitly excluded that once this is used for anything commercial, it needs a different licensing agreement, right? But nevertheless, I, maybe when we dive into that, I can show you yeah, we'll wh what I mean. Right. Right? We'll find out who is using Yeah, but I mean, uh, they have, therefore, the other way around, uh, these tools, that this is like, I, in the meantime, in the, in the beginning, I was like thinking, discussing uh, with friends, colleagues, uh, uh, researchers, but these days, I almost see it like a spell checker tool, right? You use it all the time, right? Nobody expects you uh, to be perfect with your syntax, et cetera. People use Grammarly, whatever. Uh, and you don't write, uh, yeah, I use Grammarly to get the syntax, the spelling, and the grammar right, right? Uh, no one do, does it. And of course, this is much more comprehensive in terms of what it does, for what it can do for you. You can write the whole paper, the whole email, the whole whatever, right? Therefore. I wanted to say, so I will here and there highlight, and maybe you notice, you will see uh, that this is coming from uh, the machine, even if it's not as clear as like the screenshots that I've been showing. Well, if you see a screenshot, it's, that's like the screenshot from JetGPT, right? That's not a big deal, but I will use code, for example, where you might not know this, right? Uh, but in the end, <laughs> there's lots of stuff, and sometimes even it's the, the verbatim uh, variable names that I get back from what I've been publishing over years, right? When you see, like, this is exactly the, the name that I've used over my five books for that, right? Uh, or six books. But anyways, this is my personal note. I just wanted to say it up front and not a hundred times whenever we come to such a point. And beyond that, of course, everything that we do here is technical illustration and not financial or investment advice. And the code, as usual, doesn't come with any uh, uh, <laughs> warranty or representation uh, to the extent permitted by applicable law. But we are not building here atom bombs or whatever. So it's just like working with financial data and applying a bit of AI. But in the times where people have obviously more um, are afraid of AI more than about anything else. Sometimes I get the feeling reading Twitter, right? Um, this might be noteworthy. So AI wars, I use this word just for uh, publicity and right? uh, state of the art. Of course, we have now so many fantastic things out there. Um, it is not something that we say, well, it's a new movie and everybody is, uh, has watched uh, it in the past. This is something that is there to stay. We cannot define it away. Um, in particular, Microsoft is building this now into all the tools that they have. Think of uh, weird PowerPoint slides where you just type a prompt and then you get like 20 slides, right? Um, <laughs> AI generated, etc. And then we have on the lower right hand side uh, now this, I don't know how they, how they call themselves, uh, this corporation, abstractly, neutrally speaking where they uh, work together in order to define standards for responsible AI, et cetera, right? But overall, what we for sure can say is that what we see there now evolving, and, and it's there, it's there to stay, and it's getting better, and it's getting more um, um, comprehensive over time, this has a real economic impact, not for, for companies like OpenAI, whose valuation is going through the roof. But here, that's the reason why I've uh, chosen this quote here from a McKinsey report that just recently came out. Generative AI's impact on productivity could add trillions of dollars in value. So we are talking about trillions, right? When was the last time after the internet and maybe uh, mobile phones where people were talking about trillions of dollars, right? There's hardly any other thing that you can think of. It's a thousand billions, right? the trillions. And uh, latest research here estimates that generative AI could, could add the equivalent of 2.6 trillion to 4.4 trillion annually across the 63 use cases. 
by comparison, the United Kingdom's entire GPT, cheap, <laughs> cheap PT, I, I'm saying it too often these days, you know, <laughs> GDP, cross domestic product in 2021 was 3.1 trillion, right? So that's what we are talking about. There's a, a lot at stake. Uh, people are afraid of the dangers and risks of uh, AI, what it poses. And I'm basically with you, Noah Harari, who has read or listened to the books, Sapiens, Homo Deus, 20, 21 questions for the 21st century. Nobody, oh, forget about AI, you need to read these books. They are, they, you need to, that's like, uh, not only the content is uh, very important for everybody, I would say, for every human being at least. Um, it's also nicely written. Um, and he says that basically whole of humanity, the whole history is a story of words. Uh, it's a story of words, it's now playing, I'll say, is um, influenced by our language, by stories, by books, by the written word. And the AI now is better at writing. This is one of his main arguments. Uh, about coming up with stories than human beings have ever been. And uh, as, a, as a corollary, this means that we don't need to be afraid of robots walking around and then having uh, laser guns or whatever, uh, threatening humanity. It's enough that the generative AIs and the large language models are so good <coughs> at yeah, coming up with words. So. Um, there are these extreme examples where uh, people fell in love with the AI, right? With the chatbot, et cetera. I don't want to go into these details, but um, the major message is text is powerful and the whole web, and we've seen this here, in particular in the US with regard to election cycles and social media and um, conspiracy theories, et cetera, right? The, the written word is powerful and the machine is much, much better and a thousand times more efficient in writing stories than we uh, have ever been. On the other hand, there are of course these very important questions with regard to what does it mean for higher education or for education in general, right? Um, this is just from uh, end of last week, right, 19th of October, uh, Bloomberg.com, um, <coughs> here, Professor of Columbia, then Wang, I don't know him, but it's the guy they interviewed, obviously, says, Today, today's AI courses must address the technology's limits and opportunities. The goal actually is not to advocate or promote the use of AI tools, but rather for students to see, experience, and understand the benefits but importantly, also the constraints. And this is what I want to do with you as well. Yeah, throughout, right? AI also will factor into how business are, business are structured and how they operate. Organizationally, it will grow to become a part of everyday communication, from email memos, reports, and marketing copy, to product development through the science of engineering and other processes. Understanding this too will be as essential for future execu executives as mastering public speaking and learning how to lead a team. So these are really far-reaching consequences of this uh, new technology. And of course, this article was about uh, B-schools. We had a B-school, but this holds true for any sub-discipline like finance and you name it, right? Um, that's, that's really an important part. And uh, I think there are many, many <coughs> questions, but not too many real answers for that, right? Uh, people must come up with policies, how to handle certain things, etc. But first and foremost, I'm on the technology, on the user side and on the teaching side. I'm not really concerned with what happens if a student has an assignment and uses JetGPT to work on the assignments or to solve math uh, equations whatsoever. That's something that others need to come up. I find it fascinating that you can ask uh, even involved mathematical questions and it comes up with, um, uh, with uh, answers uh, within seconds, right? Where you might need to work a day two or three in order to come up with a, with a proper answer. Right? Of course, this must have far reaching consequences. So now coming to this uh, part here before we then uh, might have a little bit of a group discussion, but I said this is a workshop, so we, um, um, we should do something. Who has a JetGPT account? 
not everybody. Getting one is not that difficult or what we can also use. Um, this, from my experience, is a pretty good alternative. I use it all the time instead of uh, Google search these days. Um, I don't think you even need an account, but even the free account is easy to establish and then you get your history. That's for me the only benefit. Beyond being somehow, or if I would like to, um, uh, to uh, top up the, um, the capabilities by getting into a paid tire. But the one that I mentioned here is uh, Perplexity AI. So this is something that you can use like a Google search, right? Perplexity AI. So if you have a JetGPT account, you can open that one, or uh, you go to Perplexity AI. It's not the very same thing. It's also GPT powered. It's, it has different models like Clo2 in the back end. Um, um, but yeah, let's see and give it a try. Um, this one, for example, cannot really do what, um, what I want to show first, namely um, to get into some research. So this is here with a different resolution. If you can see, read something, let me know. I tried. The from the That's the first one, yeah. So I, I think for the projector here in front, it's better to go with the light with the light one. So you find this one here in the uh, GitHub uh, repo. When you go to um, code, here you find numbered. That's the sequence of the notebooks that I want to go through with you. And you find here the first one that I've just opened. That's, I would say, the yeah, one of the smallest ones. There are just a couple of links that I want to um, use and also some prompts that I want to use. Right. So first thing, and I think for me, I, I don't know how many hundred books I've read in my life. Um, I always summarize them. I came up, I don't know, with mind maps whatsoever and research papers uh, for me not to count, uh, looking backwards, right? And one of the first real use cases for me, and this is what I got started with and did it all day long in the beginning, <laughs> was um, to discover research, right? To go through stuff. And I have here uh, the first example, that's my own book. So I've uh, hosted here chapter one of my financial theory with um, Python book, right? So I don't need to do a right click. I can, what is that? This used to work before? Oh no, it didn't work. I don't know why I saved this wrongly, so there must be an additional underscore. I don't know where I copied this from. I need to look in here. So it must be chapter underscore or one. I thought I copied this. Maybe I wrote this out. Chapter underscore o one. Um, let me just commit this. Uh, okay. Sorry? Yeah, the underscore. So I've just pushed it in the corrected version to GitHub. Let me see whether it's there. Yeah, it's already there, right? So the underscore was missing. So I start with one of my own. Um, texts, uh, but this would be a little bit boring if I could only summarize my own text. That's the first chapter of my previous book. Um, it's not that huge. You see here 16 pages, computational finance, artificial intelligence, right? Um, I'm not interested in the details. I don't want to go through that. But before I get into JetGPT with the uh, front end here, with the standard front end, I want to show you in this particular context, because this works like a charm. Um, it works also from uh, JetGPT, I can show you that. But here I want to get started first with the PDF. And I have now, I, here you see it, it's called JetGPT Glarity. I need to reload the page, I've just activated it. So now you see in the right hand corner here, this icon, this little icon here, pretty small. 
right? But I can now click on this, and this reopens or opens in another window, another tab. The same, the same text, and immediately get started with a summary of that text, right? No, that's a Chrome extension. I just want to get started. You can do the same thing basically with um, uh, with JetGPT, but here I start with the PDF and then I just click on this icon, and you see it provides um, the. Um, the summary, this chapter provides an overview of the topics covered in the book. It discusses the history and major trends in finance, including the increasing use of tech. So instead of going through 16 pages, you get here for free, if you like, and pretty quickly you get the summary, right? And this alone for me, it's like sliced bread, better, right? Uh, when you read a lot, when you want to go through something that you have never heard of and you want to judge whether you are likely to find what you're looking for, uh, this alone. But that's just like a per mil of what uh, the, the technology can do. I can here, for example, uh, ask a question with regard to this text. So this is now not the general big world. We are just within this PDF. Uh, what financial, financial topics are mentioned in the chapter? Right. So I even forgot the question mark, doesn't care. Right? Financial topics in the chapter include the history of finance, major trends in finance, the four languages of finance, English finance, mathematics and programming, and the role of Python in finance. So now you can go on. You, you ask your question, you, so to say, interact with the author, with myself. <laughs> and um, and uh, don't need to basically, in the end, need to read what is in there. With this clarity application, I can also go to uh, YouTube, for example, and now you see what I'm usually looking. Here, a lot of uh, health stuff, and let's say here I go recently, I've listened to many, or that one. Let's go to a longer one, uh, not, the, not the music one. Um, that one here. I, d I don't know. Let, let me search for Andrew Huberman. He usually does. Uh, anybody in here who knows Andrew Huberman? He has become so popular as like the health, health pope. Right? <laughs> um, he speaks about everything here. One of his last thing, uh, last podcast was with um, uh, Zuckerberg and his wife. So when I go Welcome to, to the, the page, it now plays it. I'm not interested. You see, this is like two hours and 15 minutes, right? And sometimes you might sit there and go through it, and then they have like these uh, frequency distribution like things where they show this is uh, uh, repeated most often, and maybe you go to that. But again, I can use the same thing from before. So, JetGPT Clarity. Uh, I have configured my browser Welcome so that it Lab only. Podcast. Discuss science um, and science-based tools. Gets access life. when I click on it. Otherwise, it is on every page and tries to summarize and is working all day long, right? And here now you see Glarity showing up on the screen of YouTube. And I now click on Generate Summary. And every YouTube video, when it has uh, one of the language that can be transcribed, has a transcription, a full text, and now Clarity via GPT in the back end again, accesses the transcript and summarizes the two hours, 15 minutes for you. Here it does it in a specific way. First, a general summary. Mark Zuckerberg, co-founders of the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative, discussed their mission to cure all human diseases, blah, blah, blah. And then it does even here some highlighting, right? Highlights Mark Zuckerberg. Set collaboration, da da da, and basically, if you're not like somebody who wants to listen to all his podcasts, this now gives you an overview, and you can much much better decide what is in there. So that's here the uh, the uh, other use case where this Chrome extension, it's an app, but it, it comes as a Chrome extension, is um, dedicated for. Or you go to uh, Google to the search page. Again, I need to uh, activate it here. 
JetGPT, reload. All right now you see the icon here. Uh, when we say um, discretization of geometric Brownian motion, Euler discretization, right? So this is what we are all used to, right? Oh, there is hopefully a good hit in the beginning and we jump on it, right? This is nothing here, let's say, <laughs> with any business related. So we don't see ads in the beginning, quant finance, stack exchange, um, deriving the discretized equation of the geometrics, simulating stochastic differential equation. This sounds all good, but what would you do? You you have a look at this and say, well, this sounds promising for my problem, a numerical STE solution. Yeah, maybe that's exactly what I'm looking for, but who knows, right? And you can then scroll down, scroll down. You see all these scientific, semi-scientific articles, PDFs, blog posts, uh, papers, whatever, right? Here, official paper, then something else. Uh, here, deep AI and clarity now does with all these search results uh, the same thing but not in a way that it says I have found 17 things here it provides you a summary including maybe like you see here including yeah a simplified difference equation here you get also the uh, sources from which it has taken right uh, here from the hit results. Uh, I think like a charm, right? So uh, and now you can ask additional questions with regard to what is all in there, right? Um, and these are three major use cases of this Clarity Chrome extension that I use. So I start here basically for like not with the, the core of the core. This is one of the applications of an extension that is built around the GPT API that I mentioned before, right? But I think this is, this makes searching and, and discovering so much more effective, uh, I can't even measure it. So for me, the numbers that McKinsey came up, the trillions of dollars, alone from this point of view for knowledge workers, think of a lawyer, think of a, uh, a medical practitioner, whatever, right? This works, of course, not only for finance, this works basically for everything. And when I was typing like this, I, I don't do this anymore these days. I don't know, uh, maybe, uh, two or three times a week or five times a week I go to Google these days uh, or maybe it's more often but the use cases there are more like uh, what is the phone number of a restaurant I want to make a reservation I know exactly what I want to do and I just need this one specific piece then I go to Google type the name of the restaurants where we live or whatnot and then I get immediately I can even click and then call on, on the iPhone that's my use case there but when I have a general question like this how do I implement an Euler discretization of a geometric Brownian? I would never go through that. I'm still now not on the uh, JetGPT side. I go to Perplexity, which is also an app that is powered again in the back end by uh, GPT 3.5 generally. Right? I can ask here similar questions. Right? I can say, how can I... Here, usually you would, would ask real questions. Discretize. Discret oh, it's this set here. It's like in the UK English. Um, discretize um, the geometric Brownian motion based on a Euler discretization. Provide provide a Python example of the implementation, right? Here, a question mark, I mean, question marks are not really required. It knows that this is a, a um, question, right? To discretize the geometric Brownian motion based on the OLM. Here, the output, of course, is much nicer. It knows how to write LaTeX, right? Uh, this here is already, where was it here? It's already good, but you see that's kind of limited with regard to the other. It's text, pure text output. The other output is markdown, including, yeah, proper math, proper LaTeX. And it's generating now here, define the parameters of the GBM, um, discretize the interval and, and junks, generate, da-da-da, 
And then here we go. Here is a Python implementation of the above steps. It even provides a visualization that I haven't uh, even asked for. Right? So isn't this like <laughs> better, much better than slice spread? Right? So when you're working with like math inputs into the generative models, do you actually find that they work differently whenever you use LaTeX as your mathematical input instead of plain language? I hardly ever have any math input, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it understands it. It understands so. It understands the latex model, and then I say, give me the code in, let's say it's an optimization model, and I could even choose in what kind of environment to produce the, the Python code, and it would do it. Yeah, yeah that's uh, input wise and output wise, they have come and such a long way. It works because it can yeah. read it. That's kind of what I've found as well, is that if you're struggling with a mathematical formula, <coughs> like trying to figure it out in the AI, uh, it works a lot better if it gets it in LaTeX format. So this is actually really quite cool. That you can get, instead of just like copying a PDF or something like that, or handwriting, trying to describe what the math is doing. Sure, and then speak, speaking of copying, you can copy the Python code, or um, here you can copy the whole thing, right? As here, copy to clipboard, right? Uh, and then paste it in the Jupyter Notebook, stuff that I do absolutely regularly these days, right? The, the markdown output is there, you copy it in the Jupyter Notebook. Get, uh, there are tiny little differences that you need to maybe adjust, right? Uh, with regard to what is LaTeX or not. But again, I mean, I'm still, every time I see it, I'm amazed. It's like, I can't believe it because I'm old enough to vividly still recall the old days and how we have done the stuff there, when I learn LaTeX, oh my goodness. <laughs> but this is just uh, one part, right? <coughs> now maybe coming to uh, JetGPT here, um, to a uh, new chat, and you see here um, in the interface that we have these days in the pro version at least, that I'm paying for 20 US dollar, I would pay 200 US dollar, I would pay 500 US dollar per month for that. Hopefully nobody. So you think that like paying for ChatGPT 4 is worth it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, of course, you get all the, the plugins, etc. Uh, so you get all the, uh, everything that's beta, it's just like available for the pro people, right? I did a fun exercise where I got to generate some just random Dolly stuff based on images, threw, it through, the, uh, threw the images back to the advanced data analysis and got it to pull out the, like, the key hex codes for it, and then got it to plot a model that I was working on, like generate the graph based on those key hex codes, and it's creating like like the full <laughs> generating like the lid space span between the different hex codes to create a, a gradient. <laughs> it's just kind of like the fact that you can just do all of that within the model without leaving it is kind of insane. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's like when they speak of general AI, right, uh, or AGI, artificial general intelligence, I mean, we are not that far away from my point of view, right? Uh, and I recently heard this, and this was my impression as well. So, what was defined 10 years ago as AGI has moved quite a bit <laughs> because we are so close to what people thought would be AGI now, close or beyond that. Right, that's the difference. So here you're talking about uh, DALI, right? Uh, for our simple examples here, we don't need it. Maybe we want to browse the web. So when they came out with it, everybody probably knows that in uh, November, almost exactly one year ago, um, just after I left Austin, right? <laughs> Uh, the one thing that was uh, back then was the, the um, yeah, the SPF story. So I was listening uh, in the news about SPF. This was the uh, crackdown, the, the bankruptcy, so to say. Uh, one of the last things I heard about CC. No, 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 I'm, I'm not investing, right? Uh, dog with too many fleas, or what he was saying. I don't know. And the second thing afterwards in November is JetGPT came out. Uh, from that point on, right, in the beginning, it was not like with all these beta features, just the default, even the default has become uh, much, much better. But the model GPT-4 is trained on data up until uh, September 2021. 
So when you ask something like, who is the current CEO of company X, Y, that, it might provide or might have provided the right answer if it was still the same as in September 2021. Uh, or if the CEO has changed in 2022, it might have provided the wrong answer. Right? But now with the capability of browsing the web, what perplexity AI also does and pretty fast, much faster um, than uh, JGPT itself, it has access to current information. You can ask what, what was the score, uh, the result of uh, Bayern Munich against Borussia Dortmund on the last weekend. So it can answer these questions now. Um, a major advance here, advanced data analysis, we come to that um, as well. Um, this allows JetGPT not only to generate code, but to also execute the code and to also generate uh, visualizations. Then plugins, there's now like, like Chrome extensions. I don't know how many Chrome extensions there are, 100,000 plus, I don't know. I don't have a number. We could probably ask the AI how many there are. Uh, and you can uh, get plugins here for math, for PDF reading, for all. I don't have an overview of what is uh, all out there. Uh, I only use a few for PDF reading, for uh, math, uh, and sometimes a few more. And then there is DALI, um, which helps you creating images like uh, Mid Journey or all these others, or DALI standalone. Um, here it is now included. But let's focus on the stuff that we have in hand. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm going to have to interrupt at some point because there, this question is in use at 11. Um, and we did, weren't able to solve the 125 problems so we're returning. We are going to the training lab. <coughs> I've looked for a classroom and there is none. Yeah, so we can stay there for as long as we want. We can time. stay there for as long as we want. Unfortunately, we're, you know, students that would probably that training lab would be able to do, or try to find one. So we're going to go to training lab um, for the rest of the workshop. All right. Or maybe it's up to you if you can say in a couple of minutes, but it can be Oh, yeah, we, we have to, as I understand, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Maybe to just close this up here, I have copied now the text from Perplexity. From, from Perplex, Perplexity AI to JetGPT, it generates something similar, but not exactly the same, obviously. And if uh, this is something that we, of course, in this context, need to get used to, even if you ask JetGPT the same question over and over, you might get different answers. Hopefully, they are all correct. This is what we hope for, right? Uh, and not some hallucination or whatnot, or simply wrong. Uh, but there is some randomness obviously included in this whole thing. But here you see, and it's kind of, you see that's already quite a bit slower than a perplexity AI. So for, for quick, snappy things, like the more easy stuff, I uh, like to use perplexity because it's simply spitting it out more or less immediately. And here you see, uh, it's like somebody is sitting there and typing. Maybe they do it intentionally, right? to give you exactly that feeling. I don't know, but I could imagine the millions of people using it. Right? And here uh, we now have the, um, the Python code and the explanation, again, with LaTeX, et cetera. Uh, pretty, pretty fantastic. I wish I would have had something like this back when I was writing my PhD, right? Yeah. Um, but this is already, I don't know how many years, 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. 